I did have some good time when I was away to sit down next to the pool, sit on the airplane, read and contemplate about the Word. That's always good uh, to pray and to thank the Lord to, to let the Word just grow in your heart. So as you know, we are camping in Psalms, in Psalm 119. <clears throat> and I love the Word of God. I don't know about you. Do you love the Word of God? Psalm 119 is about the Word. He uses so many different words for the Word. And we are busy with this theme that we started to developing. And today I want to talk to you about instructions to keep a pure life. Now, as I said before, if you go through Psalms, it's divided in eight uh, uh, verses. If you, if you divide it in eight verses, each one of those eight verses makes up the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. Last week or the previous time, I was talking about Aleph, the first eight. The next eight is Beth, that is the B in the alphabet. And it's amazing how you find all of these practical lessons. And, and I've looked at this over the last two weeks when I was away, and I looked at this, and I read through the psalm again, and I looked about what I was going to say this week, and we're going to camp in here, we're going to stay in psalms for the next few weeks. This is more practical lessons. Practical application to your life. And this is how you should see that. I want you to understand this, and we will see that today in what I'm going to talk to you about, that this was still written under the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant. We are living under the New Covenant. But it's not to say that we cannot learn lessons from the Old Covenant. If we can't learn lessons from the Old Covenant, then you might as well take all of the Old Testament and rip it out of your Bible. You take all of that and you just rip it out. No, no. That is where we were formed. It comes out of the Old Covenant into the New Covenant. Praise the Lord we are in the New Covenant. Who is glad that we are in the New Covenant? If we were not in the New Covenant, you had to fulfill practically each and every laws of the Old Testament. Which we still do, by the way. But we are now doing it in Christ. Because we saw in the Old Testament that it fails. We can't. No one sitting here can fulfill the whole law. The Pharisees couldn't do it. And we had to outshine the Pharisees to be able to do that. And I'm so glad I don't have to do it. Because it's going to be a works-based religion than what we're in. Just how hard you work. And if there's somebody working in this church harder than others, this is what you find. You know, I, I saw it through my window yesterday. I was out. And when I came back, I saw these beautifully dressed ladies walking down the, 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 the road. And you know, we all know who they are. It's the witnesses. You know, when they knock on my door, I don't call them Jehovah Witnesses. I say, you're not deser deserving that name. You are Russellites. They don't like it, but I say, this is where you're coming from. You are following your father, which is Russell, the founder. So don't call yourself Jehovah Witnesses. You're not witnessing for Jehovah, my Jesus. It's a different Jesus. You are witnessing for Russell. You're a Russellite. Now, no, I say it with love. <laughs> of course I do because people need to know the truth I speak the truth in love in insincerity but this is the thing that when we follow Christ we want to follow him in the right way you know we want to follow Christ and learn more about him and the way that we do it is we look into the old covenant and we learn from that we open up the scriptures, we study. I love the Word of God. Somebody said to me once that I love the Word of God more than, the, than, than God Himself. And I said, how can that be? How can that be if I love the Word of God more than God? The more I read the Word, the more I study the Word, the more I meditate the Word, the more I learn about God. That's it. And He lived amongst us. And we had fellowship with Him. I mean... To think for yourself that the God of the universe, our God, who is the creator of this universe, has put His mind in this book, in this letter for you and for me. And then to say to me that you love the Word more than God, how can it be? It's one, it's the same. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word is God. So it is so wonderful that as we turn to the pages, and what you will find here is only the Word. I don't want to tell you stories about how I grew up or, 
you know what I bought yesterday at Bunnings and now there's a scriptural lesson into that. No, no. I want to come to the Word of God and give you practical lessons out of the Word of God. And this is what we're going to find again today. So if you look at our theme, we started the theme when we looked into Psalms. The theme there is delighting ourselves in the Word of God and meditating in it day and night. That's our theme. Delighting ourselves in the Word of God. Are you still delighting yourself in the Word of God? Are you absolutely pouring yourself into the Word of God? Are you spending your time in the Word of God? And, and let it be known, you have precious time. Every single moment this watch on my hand is ticking off seconds, it's ticking off of my life. My life is getting shorter the longer I live. Is that you? Or is it only me? No, it is you. So every, every single second, every single minute that you live is precious. The Bible says that we need to count our times and our days. And the best thing that I can tell you today is to spend your time in the Word of God. Because then you will know more about God. And then He will change you more into the image of His Son. And by the way, you will start to live a blessed life, which is a happy life, Mark. Isn't it right? It's a happy life. Who wants to live a happy life? I want. I don't want to live the rest of my time out here not happy. I want to live this happy life. And this is what we need to do. We need to delight ourselves in the Word of God. But unfortunately these days you don't find the Word of God in the schools anymore. You don't find it in our governments anymore. And you don't find it in certain churches anymore. It was so wonderful. We were staying at the Novotel in Kuala Lumpur. And Leone opened up the drawer and, and there's a Gideon's Bible there. Let's give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. And I was, so, I was so glad and I was so blessed to know that there are people who are still care for the Word of God to go and to face the world and to put this book, which is the book of life, into a drawer for somebody to pick it up and read it. It is so wonderful. Are you still, how much did you delight yourself in the Word of God this last week? How much did you, did you pour yourself into that? How much did you meditate? Did you meditate in it day and night? You see the word delighting there comes from chepets. That's the Hebrew word. It means to desire it, to long after it, to take good pleasure in it. I talk to some people and they say to me, I just don't get it. I've read through it five times and I just don't get it. And you know what I tell them? You are a liar. Because if you read through this thoroughly once, it's going to change your life. And then, and then what's going to happen, it's going to consume your life. So don't come to me and say you've read through it and you can't see it. It's not a storybook. It is His story. And that's so wonderful about it. And that's what we're proclaiming. You see, this is our thing. We delight you. We desire. When I open up in the morning, when I open up at night, before I go to sleep, I desire to know what God was God for me. And listen to me, young man, young woman sitting here today, and I'm still one of those. Listen to me. If you pour yourself into the Word of God, it's going to consume your life. And you will study your whole lifetime, and you will not come to the depths, the width, the height, or whatever in the Word of God, it will consume you. I was sitting with a missionary, 70 and 5 years old, Brother Pete Compton, and you know what he said to me at that age? He said, I'm still learning from God through His Word. And I said, Lord, I want to be like that when I am 70 and 5 years old. Desiring God's Word. You can't go wrong. The second word which stood out here for me is meditating. That's part of your theme. We find it in Psalm 1 verse 2, you remember? Who remembers Psalm 1 verse 2? He says, I delight. That's actually the verse that says it there. I delight myself in the Word of God and meditate on it day and night. The word meditate there is hawa, which means to murmur. To murmur. Have you ever thought about that? To meditate on it. It is a murmuring going on. It's continuing on. He says to growl or to ponder upon it. 
Have you ever take a scripture verse and you sit there and you, you just think about this verse and you just let the Holy Spirit and ask God to open it up for you more and more and more. And as you continue through that, it just consumes you. And this is our theme, and it's a beautiful theme. I say, Lord, make this theme, stamp it on my forehead, so that I never forget the law of God. But I want to de de delight myself in the Word of God. Why? Because I will know Him better and more. Don't you love the cry of a baby? I hope you're not sitting here and say, oh man, I love, that's the sound of new life. It's beautiful. And as you know, we've got a new grandchild. Amen. Look at Joshua when he writes this down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Where is the mouth? What do we do with our mouth? We talk with our mouth. He says, the book shall not depart, the law shall not depart, it shall not go away from you. That's what depart means. Unfortunately, these days, it has departed for so many people. It is an old dusty book lying in their bookshelf. He says, but it shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. You see, the men of old had something that they knew that we need to learn. We need to learn that again. We need to meditate on the word day and night. And see what it says. That you may observe to do according. Everybody say to do. What does that mean? It means to obey. So the more you study the word of God, what happens? You know more about Him, but you know more to obey. That's what meditating also means. We need to obey God's word. We need to do the things He tells us to do in there. And this is so true. Observe it. To do according to all. Everybody say all. Not only the parts that you like. You know there's some people who go through this and they read. And they go, I don't like this piece of paper. And then you might as well tore it out of your Bible. If it's about sin, some people don't want to preach it. Cut it out with a scissor. Why do you have it in your Bible? But I'll tell you what, you start doing that, you're on a slippery and a dangerous slope. Because soon and soon your Bible will become very, very thin. And you will have nothing to read in there, and then you will go to the magazines. But some people do want to do that. He says, observe all of it. Every single word. Let me tell you something, friend. I believe, standing in front of you today, I believe every single word that's written in this book. Every single one of them. And let me tell you more. That every single one of those things written in that book was written for me. And for you. And it's there written for me to change my life. Now if I'm going to start cutting out of it, and I say, oh this, you know, it comes a little bit too close to home because it talks about unforgiveness. Ooh, you don't know what they've done to me. But here it stands, it says, forgive. For Jesus has forgiven you. Who knows that? Oh, I don't like that. Get your scissors out there. Tear it out of your Bible. Remember, let me just say, if you tear one page out of this Bible, it's worth nothing. Every single word is written for a purpose there. And it is so wonderful because it becomes an instruction. He says all that is written in it for, everybody say for. It is an application word now. He says for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. So where's the young people who's looking for great success in life? There's only one way for you. And listen, by the way, prosperous there doesn't mean the, the, the newest car or house. Paul talks about this in Ephesians, says, I bless you with all of the heavenly blessings. Heavenly blessings, by the way, is much more worth than all of your earthly possessions. Come on, shout hallelujah to that. Hallelujah. Do you believe what I'm saying? Yes. Then shout it as if you mean it. Hallelujah! hallelujah. <laughs> all of the heavenly blessings, Mark, is much more worth of everything. Your net worth is nothing. Let me just tell you, your net worth will be spent by the next generation. But your heavenly blessings, you will be with that in heaven. Where no moth of, or moth, it won't rust. How wonderful is that? It's a different economy. It's totally different. Oh, the petrol price is going up. So what? 
I've got an economy which no man can touch. You vote whomever you want to vote, I trust Jesus Christ. Amen? And it's so wonderful. He says, what will make you prosperous? Let's ask the question. If we meditate on the Word of God, that Lord there means the Word of God, every single day and night according to what is written, you will become prosperous and you will have good success. Man, I want good success. I don't want to fail. Who wants to fail here? No, no, I want to have good success, but I know where the foundation of that success lies, and it's nothing this world can offer me. I love it in the Old Testament, again, when the people love the Word of God so much, that in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, he says, your works were found, your words were found. Have you found the words of God? Have you truly found them? He says, they were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me joy and rejoicing of my heart. Is that how you feel? Is that how you feel when you read the word of God, when it brings joy to you? People look at you and say, what is he and she on? Is it it Red Bull? Is it V? Whatever. No, no, I am on the word of God. I am on the life of life. The true living life. And this is what it is. He says, he says, I ate the word of God. Which means, you know, it doesn't mean you need to tear it down and start eating the paper. You will get bad digestion. You need to start reading it every single time as if it is food for your soul. And it is. It is so beautiful. The next verse where in Ezekiel it says, And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll, which means the word of God that I give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. Is the word of God sweetness and honey to you? I told you the story the last time, and it's not a story, it's an actual fact, that the Hebrew people took their little children into the synagogues because they study the Torah. They love the Torah. They live for the, They walk around with the Torah in front of their heads with a small little black box. They, they, if they, in, in their houses, in the front door, they've got a box there with the law in there. And every time when a Jew walks out, he touches the box. They love the Word of God so much. And you know what they do? They bring these children into the synagogue. And they bring the Torah out and they put honey, a drip of honey on the paper. And they get them to taste with their lips, touch that little paper with the honey on. And it tastes like sweet honey. And they fall in love with that Torah. Have you tasted the honey of God through His Word? Have you? Have you? Have you tasted the sweetness thereof? If you say to me, no, it is bitter. Yes, it is bitter at first, but then it turns into sweetness. Go and read it in the book of Revelation. He says, when I ate it, it was like bitterness in my stomach, and then it turned into sweetness. Yes, it will be bitter when the Word of God sorts out your life, and it convicts you of your sin. It's bitter, I know, it's painful. But once it turns sadness into joy, once it turns that heaviness of the sin into the freedom of Christ, it becomes sweeter than honey. Amen? Amen. Are you glad for the Word of God today? This is it. This is where it comes from. It is, it is, it is the life blood. You know, it is His word to us. It is His joy to us. It is the bitterness to us as well. We need to take the good and the bad. Job's wife came to him and said, Hey, come on, mochatrocha. Have you learned that word from me? That's a South African word. It means it's all over, man. Mochatrocha. Give it up and curse God. Curse God and be over with it. And he says, Shall I curse God because it's going bad with me? No. But we come to the Word of God and we find the joy in the Word of God. Now, the first topic we had in our first one was the three cornerstones of a happy life. You remember that? And that was the Alpha. That was in Psalm 8, verse 1 to 8. And he spoke about obedience, prayer, and praise. Are you, are you obedient to the Word of God? This is practical. I've, the more, the last two weeks when I was away in Kuala Lumpur, there in Langkawi, lying in the sun, getting a suntan, I was thinking about this. It is practical. These are practical. And practical things are things we do. We need to obey the Word of God. We need to pray and then praise. And what do we say? The shortest part from problems to praise is prayer. That's what we said the first time. And you can go and listen to that again. But today I want to talk to you about the best part of that. The best, best part of that. The instructions to keep up your life. Now let me just say this. And I said it at the beginning. 
Psalm was written under the Old Covenant. When you read the Old Covenant, it is a distinction that you need to understand, you need to make that. What happened under the Old Covenant? Their sin was covered with blood of animals. You remember that? They had to fulfill the law. There were sacrificial laws that they had to fulfill. They had to bring an animal and they had to lay their hand on the animal and that animal became the scapegoat or became the one who took their sins and that covered them. But brothers and sisters, I've got good news for you. We are not under that covenant anymore. We are under the new covenant. And the new covenant is where Jesus Christ came and He, he replaced the blood of animals with His own blood which not only covered the sins because if you cover sins the sin are still there but in the new covenant what did He do? That blood came and He washed it away. Come on, shout hallelujah. He washed your sins away. And these men, when I'm going to read to you Psalm of David, when I'm going to read this Psalm to you, think always that they were sitting under that covenant with that sin still pressing down and the blood covers above that so that God don't punish them. He sees the blood. But when Jesus looks at you and me right now, He doesn't see the blood of animals anymore. He sees the blood of Christ. Amen. This is why I said it like this. It's instructions to keep a pure life. I've heard people preach this and say to make a pure life. You can't get a pure life in the old covenant. You can only get the pure life in the new covenant. You can live under the instructions of a pure life in the old covenant. So this is how you keep a pure covenant. Now let's go, go into this. So... Uh, uh, the introduction was found when we talk about purity in verse 1. You remember in Psalm 119 verse 1, he said, Blessed, which means happy are the undefiled. Everybody say undefiled. In the way who walk in the law of the Lord. He says, blessed or happy are the undefiled person. This means the pure person. He says, if you are pure, you are happy. If you are pure, you are happy. So you can only be happy when you are pure. That's all. If you've got sin in your life, if you've got things in your life, you will be the most unhappy person in life. I'm not asking you this, I'm telling you because I'm a human being like you. The times when I've done something wrong and I know because my conscience convict me I'm wrong, I'm the most unhappiest person you can find and the most frustrating person you can find. Paul says the things I want to do, I, I don't do them. And the things I don't want to do, I do them. And here it is. He said, blessed are the undefiled, the one who's pure in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. So purity means to be free from contamination. That's what purity means. There's no contamination in it. Now we've all done this, haven't we? Who loves scrambled eggs? <laughs> And I love scrambled eggs, and I make my own eggs, you know, I, I make the, I love to make eggs. And in fact, in our house, I'm the champion egg maker, okay, nobody beats me in our house. That's the one thing I do very good. My sons, Richard and Gavin, they do these meats, man, they cook it the whole day. I go, man, that's too much for me. But ask me to make a good e e scrambled egg, man, I can make a good omelette, scrambled eggs, you, you know me. So there I was standing one day and I, I, I don't do it on that way, I just throw everything in the pan, man. I haven't got that patience. But here's one thing that I found when you make scrambled eggs, is you break the egg and you throw it in, you break it and you throw it in. And all these eggs are good and they're yellow and they're pure. What happens if you take a rotten egg and you throw it in there? What happens? You see, here is the pure in there and then comes the undefiled or the impurity and you put it in there. Now, in eggs, can you just take a spoon and scoop it out? It all goes to the rubbish bin, isn't it right? This is impurity. If you take 0 0.00000 and so many zeros as you can and a one at the end there of impurity, impurity, then you've got impurity. Did you, did you get that? Purity is 100% and this is what the blood of Christ do to you and me. It makes us pure. And this is what I say, you know, if, you, if you're pure, it means that you are free from contamination. In other words, there's no sin. 
there's no, there's no influences that's coming in. And this is what he says, if you do this, you would be happy to come to that place. And again, I bring you back to the new covenant where the blood of Christ washed us all away. But now we need to keep there because we are still walking through this world and we see these things in the world. Now it affects you, but it doesn't affect the purity that he gives you. It is so wonderful, brothers and sisters. In Psalm 119, verse 9, he says, How can a man cleanse his way? This is the question that we are sitting with today. How can a young man cleanse his way? How can a young man get himself clean? And under the old covenant, it is walking in the law. It's observing all of those ordinances that was put in there. But in our, in our day under the new covenant is to come to the cross of Christ, to bow before Him, to confess our sins to Him, and He comes and He forgives us our sins and our trespasses, and He saves our soul. That's the new covenant. But I'll bring you back. I'll bring you back to the upper room. You remember when Jesus walked in there and he put on the, the form of a servant and he washed their feet? He came to Peter and Peter said, no, no, Lord, no, no, don't wash my feet. I should be washing your feet. And what did Jesus say? He said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you've got nothing in me. And when the penny dropped, he says, Peter said to him, Lord, just not only my feet, but my whole body. Wash my whole body. But what did Jesus say? He said, you were washed already. But only your feet, Peter. Why only his feet? Because it was a custom of the day. Each and every house had a pot at the, at, the, at the door. And as you come in, because they were walking with Jesus sandals. You call them Jesus sandals these days. They've got a lot of them in Fiji. But if you walk on the dusty roads, what comes onto your feet? Dust. And you come into the house and they've got these cleaning pots at the front door. And you would sit down and the servant would come. You would put your foot in a basket of water and they will wash all the dust off. So that you can walk into the master's house with clean feet. So what is the message in that for us? How do we keep it clean? We are washed already by the blood of the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, let me say to you, Jesus Christ did a perfect work with you when He cleansed you. But we are working in this world. We are walking in it. We are walking in the dust of the world. So I would like to come home at night and say, Father, I want to come before you and say, Lord, I've seen a billboard here. I've seen that. I've, I've spent too much. It feels as if my feet are dirty. Please wash my feet. Are you still washing your feet? I keep confession short to the Lord. I do them daily. I said, Lord, if there's anything, and people say, whoa, what's going on? Don't you trust God? Don't you know that He knows about your sin that you're still going to commit? I say, yes, I do. But I still confess and come to Him and say, Lord, help me, strengthen me. I don't want to have anything in my life that the, that the enemy can come and have a hold on you. So this is what happens. You know, we keep it pure. That's what purity is. So instruction number one for us today, out of the next part, is to memorize God's Word. Memorize God's Word. Let's read from verse 9. He says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your Word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let not me wander from your commandments. Your Word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the first way that you can help to keep this pure life is to memorize God's Word. Are you memorizing God's Word? It's a good thing to do. You know what I still do and I used to do a lot is I take these sticky notes. If you fold them over, they make a nice little, small little sticky notes and I write on the one side, 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. On the other side, I write down the whole verse and I carry it in my pocket. And then wherever I go, I'm walking down the road and I'm looking around. I take it out, I read it, I look at it and I start talking to God about it. And then I put it back in my pocket and then later on I go maybe to the toilet and there's this little thing and I read it again and I walk on. And you know sooner or later what happens? The more I do that, the more it sticks and the more it goes into my heart. I memorize God's Word. Here the psalmist says, he says, I will took the word and I hide it in my heart that I may not sin against you. But it's more than just memorizing the word of God. It is obeying the word of God. This is where it comes in. It's no good for you to put it in there and you don't obey it. 
I mean, you take Christian schools these days, they get the little children to memorize passages out of the Bible. Isn't that right? I mean, Denzel came up here one time and he memorized, I mean, how many, he can memorize a lot of scripture verses, isn't it, brother? You know, we can, and, and you know, you can do that with a parrot as well. But it is living by those words. If it's inside of you and the word of God says thou shalt not do this because it is written in the word of God and it lives inside of you. Let's think about stealing, you know. Here you are, you're somebody who loves to take the pens from work, you know. It's for free, isn't it? You just take all the pens and take a lot of them because it's for free. Somebody pays for it. I'm just using a simple example, okay. But let's say there's somebody who just keeps on stealing and he reads that passage and he starts memorizing that passage and he puts it in his heart. Next time he comes out and all of a sudden the scripture verse jumps to his mind. What's going to happen? He's going to think twice before he do that. This is where it comes down to. It's not only memorizing the word, it is obeying it. It is it's something that you are seeking from God. Now I love this part here because it's a little bit... Of, but he says in verse 10, with my whole heart I have sought you i love that you know and that's this morning when i prayed about this word i read over it again and that stood out for me today i sought you lord i seek you lord i looked everywhere for you lord this is what that means and i went back to second chronicles chapter 15 and it is so beautiful that in second chronicles chapter 15 when you see when asa came and he corrected everything in the land but here it says here in verse 15 he says and all judah rejoiced at the oath they made an oath to god for they had sworn with their heart and sought him with their whole desire and he was found by them how wonderful is it when you seek god and you find him how wonderful is it is one of the most satisfying things in life when you seek God and you find Him. I, when I read that word sought there this morning, sought after Him, I said, Lord, I want to keep on seeking after You. And He was found by them. And listen now what He says, And the Lord gave them rest round about. You know what's going to happen, dear brother and sister, if you start seeking after God? He is going to give you rest. You are troublesome this morning. You've got problems in your life. You feel always sick and tired of being sick and tired. You feel that? You know that, what I'm talking about? But there's rest for you this morning if you seek after Him. And where do you start? Go to His Word and start memorizing His Word. Memorize Scriptures. You know, why don't you start memorizing a Scripture a day? Every day, memorize a Scripture. If the, is, is that too much for you? Then do it weekly. You know, memorize a Scripture every week. Is that too much for you? Do it monthly then. That's only 12 scriptures that you have to memorize for the whole year. If you do that, praise the Lord, He's going to change your life. But if you even memorize 20, and I'm going to show you at the end of this sermon a very practical way. You see, the Word of God is life. It is life. Did you know that? Did you know the Word of God is life? Can I prove this to you? I open up in uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and I know the scripture out of my mind, but I want to read it to you. The word of the Lord, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful. That word there, quick, in the King James it's quick, but in the New King James means it's alive. The word of God is living, and it is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even dividing between the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and he's the discerner of the thoughts and the hearts. That's how powerful the Word of God is. Have you got anything that can cut between bone and marrow? Don't ask a doctor. Don't ask a doctor. Spirit and soul. That's the Word of God. Now, imagine if you take that Word of God and you put it in your heart. And it starts living in your heart. It is going to discern your what? Your thoughts and your heart. And that is how you keep your life clean and pure. That is how you do it. 
You memorize it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on it. It's not a life more than food and body more than clothing. You see, when you memorize this scripture verse, if you memorize this scripture verse, if you take this scripture verse and you put it in your heart, and there comes difficult times in your life, what's going to come up in your mind? The scripture verse. I said it to you before, we do so, you know, Leonie and myself, when people come to us for counseling, we sit and we listen to them. And you know what? While we listen to them, there's so many scripture verses that this comes up in our minds. And sometimes I stop them, I say, I just want to let you know that this is a scripture. When you told me this, this is the scripture verse that jumped up in my mind. I want to give it to you. Some people go away, they don't want to hear that. They want you to take their problems away. That's not what, what counseling is there for. But this is so powerful. You see, if you just go and memorize the scripture. I mean, my sister said it here this morning when you came and testified about moving place. You were so calm. You were so sitting in the Lord. You were so waiting in the Lord. Why? How did it happen? Did it just happen like that, sister? Or is this years and years and years and time and time again where you sat in the Word of God and you memorized it, you meditated on the Word of God, and it gave you trust in the writer of those words so that you can stand one day and He will hold your faith steadfast. This is a wonderful scripture verse to memorize. And this is how you start working on your own salvation. Who remembers this verse? Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Who knows this verse? You know, some people try to say that, that we need to work on your salvation. This has got nothing to do with your saving salvation. This is to do with your maturing salvation. You work on, after you are saved, you need to work on your salvation. And how do you do that? Start memorizing God's Word. Start putting it into your heart. For it is God who works in you. You see that? Now some people try to tell me these days that we just sit there under a tree and you get soaked in the Holy Spirit and then all of a sudden thoughts and everything will start coming to you. That is so dangerous. The way that God is going to start working on you is you put His Word inside of you and now you live your life naturally. You go to your workplace. You go to your family. You go to every... You see, these days I hear people, they say, when I start talking to my family about God's Word, they get cross at me. They get mad at me. And they will. But you know what I'm saying? First, they need to see the message in your lifestyle before they're going to listen to you. Come on. They're going to live, they're going to, your children is going to see how you live. Now they might, they might be, you know, they might say, no, we don't want, want what dad has got, we don't want what mom has got, but yes, they will do one day. You just continue living in God's grace. Sometimes we want to preach the ears off instead of living our lives in front of them. Let's be honest here. You can preach to me the best sermons you can, but you can walk out of this place and live a rotten life and nobody will believe you. And this is where it starts. You work. How does God work in you? He, he starts putting His Word. This is His instruction manual. You start memorizing the Word. It goes inside of you. Now I'm coming into a situation there in my daily life and, and, and I want to react because my reaction is, yeah, I told you people I'm an anxious person. I, I can get really anxious quickly. And, and now I want to become anxious. And, and what happens when you become anxious? You can lose it. You, you can say something, you can, why well, I'm going to do this. But here is this beautiful word of God inside of you. And a scripture jumps up and you start thinking about the scripture verse. And, and it says, a soft answer turns away wrath. In the past, I would have just given them my wrath. But now the scripture verse is stopping me before I'm doing it. Are you with me now? Now I'm working on my salvation. Why? Because He's in me. His Word is in me now. The Holy Spirit which is in me is now using the Word which is inside of me to work on me. Are you with me? 
And this is what's happening. He says, he will, he will now work in you to both will and to do. He will give you something to will through His Spirit, and then He's going to give you the power and energy to do it. I said it to you before, I preach about the Scripture so many times. The word here is energizo. The word here. It comes from, a, it comes from a, a Greek word which comes from the Holy Spirit which gives you the power to do it. Oh, I can't forgive that person, preacher. I just can't forgive them. I'm not asking you to forgive them. I ask you to put the word of forgiveness in your heart so that the Holy Spirit can work in you and then you will forgive them with the power and the love of God. <sighs> Go and ask Corrie ten Boom. Read a book. That's all there. So this is how we work. You come to me and say, you know, this is the person who says to me, I've read through it five times and there's nothing in there. No, no, yeah, yeah, you haven't read through it once. You, you actually haven't read through one page. Because the hunger is not there. This is what happens. He start working in you. This is how you work on your salvation. You see, you memorize God's words to carry His light with you wherever you go. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. On Monday, I'm going to let it shine. Where am I on Monday? I'm at my office. I'm walking around my work colleagues. They need to see the gospel in me before I preach it to them. And, and you know what people say to me, well, you've got such a great opportunity to preach to everybody at that company of yours. I will, when God opens the door. But so many times, some of them came to my office and say, John, you know, you seem such a calm person. Can we talk to you? You need to live the life. So we carry God's light wherever we go. His word is like water. Let me show this to you. His word is like water. John chapter 15 verse 3. He says, you are already clean. You see? He says, I've washed you already. You're all clean because of what? You're clean because of what? Come on church, don't fall asleep on me now. You're clean because of? The word which I have spoken to you. You see, there's two kinds of word in the New Testament. There is Logos, which is the written word, and there's Rima, which is the spoken word. And He has spoken the word, and that word cleanses you. It's the same instruction He gives to husbands. Where's all the husbands? And future husbands. And past husbands. He says here, husbands, love your wives. Wow. The husbands love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her. He puts her apart. And then what does he do? Cleanses her with what? With washing of water by the? By the word. The best thing that you can do for your marriage is to sit as a couple and study the word of God together. Families who, who pray together, stay together. That's a slogan somebody wrote. It's not mine. Somebody said it and I, I like it. I want to say families who study the Word together, stay together. Amen? And this is what it is. It washes. The Word of God is so wonderful. So first of all, we see a practical application is to memorize the Word. Secondly, in your psalm, we go to verse 12. We verbalize the Word. And I like this one. He says, Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I love it here because the psalmist goes into this prayer. It feels, I can feel his heart beat actually when he cry out to God. He says, God, you are so blessed, O Lord. But Lord, teach me your statutes. Statutes is another word for the word of God. God, teach me your word. O Lord, I'm so hungry. I'm like a sponge. I want more. I want more. Is that you? He says it there. You know, this is the psalmist. I'm just getting excited about the man who wrote this by the inspiration of, the, of, of God. He says, Oh Lord, teach me your statutes. Now, why do you teach me your statutes, Lord? So that I can walk around and show everybody how clever I am? No, 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 no. With my lips I shall declare all the judgments of your mouth. I will tell people about it. That's what it is about. This is why God saved you, is to go out and tell people. You need to declare His word in your quiet time, in your conversation, in your advice with other people. This is how you declare the word of God. 
You know, I'm, if I stand with a megaphone here on the corner and shout here to Bunnings and I start shouting scripture verses out, they're going to think I'm a madman. No, no, I've got it inside of me now. It becomes part of my lifestyle. And now when I meet with my friends, what I talk about? The Word of God. When I, when I go, when I ride, when I, wherever I go, I see something beautiful there in, in, in Malaysia and, and I just stood there and I started getting scriptures coming over and I declared the word of God out there out loud. There were two Russian girls in there. They just turned around and I said, well, that doesn't matter. They had to hear it that day. We have to start verbalizing God's word. Some people are so afraid to do that. You see, David, he writes down as a king, he was making orders, he was giving judgments, he was doing it all according to the Word of God. The Word of God was so intertwined into his life that, that that's how it should be. We verbalize God's Word. Are you afraid to just mention God's Word, to talk about His Word? What is your conversation with your friends about? You know, it's okay. It's okay to have an interest. It's okay to talk about fast cars or this. Even sport teams. Somebody said to me once, you know, is it a sin to watch sport? No, it's not a sin. But what is occupying you the most? What is occupying you the most? And we need to verbalize His word more and more. Matthew chapter 12, 34. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth speaks. Now let's get to the last one today. So first of all, we memorize God's word according to the psalmist, and then we verbalize it. We start talking of it. And let me just say, let me just say, if the word of God is not inside of you, how can you talk it? How can you talk it? And, and I want to say, my brother, this is sometimes why people are afraid to go on street work. They, they're afraid of getting these difficult questions, and they wouldn't have the answer. You don't have to have the answers when you go into street work. You don't have to have the answers. Because you have the biggest answer of all living inside of you. And you testified about that. But we verbalize it. And then finally this morning we personalize it. I love this. I love this because I apply it so many times in my life. Psalm 119 verse 14. I have re rejoiced in the way of your testimonies of much as of all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and comp contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes and I will not forget your word. You see how he has personalized this. He made it, I have. He made it his own. He made the word of God his own. And brothers and sisters, if you haven't done this before, listen, you know, it's not a copycat here. You don't have to copycat what I do, but listen what I'm telling you. I verbalize the word so many times in my prayers. So many times. I'll give you a few examples and then we'll pray. First of all, you know, look at this psalm. Uh, this word. This verse here. It's a verse that everybody knows, isn't it? For God so loved the world, isn't it? But you know what I do? I look at this word and I say, For God so loved John. For God so loved me. For God so loved John that He gave His only begotten Son that when John believes in Him, John should not perish but have everlasting life. Now it's personal. So quickly, I'm going to give you a few minutes, a few seconds, not minutes. Do it yourself. Put your name in there, in your mind. Read it. Do it. For God so loved Vito. Hey. How beautiful does that sound, Vito? Hey, hey, Aaron, for God so loved Aaron that he gave his only begotten son that bread who believes in him should have an everlasting life, isn't it? This is how you personalize the word of God. He's written this for you. Let me show you another one. You know, this is when you feel unloved. You sometimes feel unloved in life. That nobody loves me. You, nobody loves me. Hey, I'm the, I'm the only person on the world. If you feel like that, if you've memorized the scripture verse, start personalizing in your prayer. Go on your knees and say, Father, I'm feeling so unloved today. My, even my children, you might have had an issue with one of your children and you feel rejected by your children or whomever. And you feel unloved. And you start praying. You say, Father, but you know what? You loved me so much that you gave your only begotten Son so that I may have eternal life. Soon you will not feel unloved because it's for you. Let's look at this one. Who, 
who fear sometimes, who's got fear in their lives. This is how you personalize the word of God. Second Timothy 1 verse 7, For God has not given John, John, a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Have you memorized the scripture verse? There's one for you to memorize. And by the way, I've used the Gideon Bible to do this. If you open up the Gideon Bible, you find all these words. Under these words, you find these scripture verses. Is that right, Anne? I've just used, I've used the Gideon Bible. I picked this one out of the Gideon Bible. Although I know this one and I've done this personally, I'm, I, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. I'm saying it to you now. And some of you saw the photos that I took. It's very high up in the sky. But when I got into that condola, we went up there onto the mountains, into the mountains, and I look at this cable and I go, What? <laughs> 100 kilograms plus, you know, and there's so many people on this little string hanging in the air. You know what I said? I said, for God has not given John a spirit of fear. Praise the Lord, and I can enjoy that. Now, let me do two more, and then we can finish. Hopelessness. Who, who's felt hopeless in your life? Come on, is it only me? Hopeless. I've, there's sometimes when you just get into a situation and doesn't matter what it's preached in church. doesn't matter what everybody around you says. It's just that feeling of hopelessness around you. You know what? Take this scripture verse. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. For I, John, hold fast the confession of my hope without wavering. For he who promised is... That's for free. Anybody, you can take that if you want to. How wonderful is that? This is how you personalize. This is how the scripture works for you. There's no magic stuff going on. These people who are preaching it to you, are they telling you lies? This is where the, the boots hit the road, the rubber hits the, the road. This is how you work on your salvation. You memorize God's word. It lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit makes it alive inside of you. Because you've got the Spirit of God in you. And now you get into situations and your faith stands more secure than somebody else. Why? Because you've got His word in you and you've got His Spirit in you. And now all of these scriptures are helping you through that. It builds your strength. This is how we do it, folk. He says, For I, John, hold fast the confession of my hope. What is the confession of my hope? Jesus Christ is coming back again for me. Without wavering, for he who promises is faithful. And what about people who feel insecure, insecurity? John chapter 10, verse 27. This is how I personalize it. John, that's me. That's me. This John. Hear my voice. This is Jesus talking to me. He comes to you and he says, Hey Mark, I want to tell you about John Shipman. Do you know that guy? Yes, he comes up here and he preaches every Sunday. Yeah, that guy, I want to tell you about him, Mark. Mark, now listen to me. This is Jesus speaking. He says, That John, hear my voice. He hear my voice. And I know John. Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus knows you? And he's talking to me. I don't, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how you're in, but he's talking to me. He says, I know. And John follows me. I follow him. And I give John eternal life. If there's so much you can take out of this verse. And John shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch John out of my hand. I'm telling you what. You start praying that back to God. You will not feel insecure anymore. Because you're secure in him. Now let me just say, I'm not changing God's word. I'm not writing my own new Bible here. I'm just personalizing it. Because it was written personally for me. I don't know about you. I don't know. Sitting here today, I just want to declare to you that this, this here is God's love letter to me. And you can also share in that. And by the way, this is God's love letter to you. And I'm going to share in that. What do you mean, preacher? Well, the more I study God's word and the more I Read, the more he changes me. Who's going to see that? You are going to see it. Each one of you. You're going to see the changes in my life. And the more you study God's word, the more I'm going to see it in your life. And this is how it works. People will come around and say, what happened to you? Have you, have you had that? People come, they say, you were this guy who was so, you know, this sinner. You were, you were all over the place, but... How did you clean up like that? He's living inside of me. It's God's word. Now let's summarize this morning. So how do we keep a pure life? We memorize God's word. We verbalize it. 
and we personalize God's word. Have we got work to do this week? Just go and memorize one verse a month, okay? I don't think that's too much to ask. Twelve verses this whole, my, whole year. You've got some catch-up to do. In fact, it's November, so you'll have to learn ten more verses before December, Marianne. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning for your word, Lord. Father, your word is truly alive, Father. It's truly powerful. It truly changes lives, Father. And I thank you that your word, Father, is bringing us life. And then, Father, above all, Jesus is declaring to be the Logos, the word, from heaven to us, the life-giving word and the light to this world. Shine through us, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm a new